Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbih wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen Allahumma ja'alna minhum wa minal ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr amin ya Rabbil Alameen thumma amma ba'ad fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim alhamdulillahi al-lazhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'allahu iwaja rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min uh, bi'idhnillah, we are starting today the first ayah of Surah Al-Kahf and the approach inshaAllah ta'ala that I'm going to be taking probably in this session is to explain one aspect of the study of the Qur'an which is intertextual relationships, that would be the technical term for it. Al-Qur'an yufassiru ba'dhu ba'dhan which means the Qur'an explains some parts of it with other parts of itself, right? So if you want to get an, an in, in-depth insight into the Qur'an then it's important to take a look at what else is Allah saying about the same exact expression all over the Qur'an or the same exact idea, how is Allah teaching us about that everywhere else in the Qur'an. So we'll take a look at some of that pertaining to one part of the first ayah today. The introductions of the Qur'an are particularly powerful and particularly you know, thought-provoking. So it's don't assume that the time we're going to take in the beginning passages of Surah Al-Kahf is going to be the same kind of time we take throughout. Hopefully we're going to get to a pace where we can finish one ayah per session, maybe two ayat. Two ayat is probably pushing it really hard. But uh, this, this first uh, introduction, uh, introductory portion, it's going to take us a little bit of time. So, and I'm okay with that, inshallah. I'd, I'd rather take my time uh, covering this stuff with you. So we'll begin today, inshallah ta'ala, but with a little bit of a conversation about alhamdulillah. In this particular case, uh, first let's talk generally about alhamdulillah. Its linguistics will come tomorrow, but today just the context of alhamdulillah. The basic definition of alhamdulillah is all praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. And the, the two things I want you to, na- to know here, al-madh wa thana. Madh means praise, uh, or actually, uh, you know, praise wa thana, this, is, this goes together which is praising and appreciating something. Okay, that's on one side of the word hamd. The other thing it includes is a shukr, a shukr, gratitude. So there are two different dimensions to the same word hamd. On the one side there is appreciation and praise, and on the other side there is gratitude. Appreciation and praise once again is al-madh wa thana, and gratitude is a shukr. They are two fundamentally different things. When you praise someone, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're thanking them. And when you're thanking someone, that doesn't actually mean you are praising them. So first understand the distinction between these two. A nice car, you praise it or thank it? You you praise it, you praise it. You'd be weird if you went over and thanked the car. Like that's not what you do. That's not normally what you do, right? Uh, Similarly, you're gonna praise the athleticism of an athlete on a team that you admire. Or you're going to praise the cuteness of a baby or something. You're not gonna thank the baby. You're going to just praise, oh, what did we do, right? That's praise. But gratitude is something entirely different. Gratitude is actually a reaction. Is it not? Gratitude is a reaction. Something good was done to you, and in response, you express gratitude. As a matter of fact, you might even express gratitude to someone that isn't praiseworthy. Ibrahim salam's father is not a praiseworthy man. You understand? He, He builds idols. But Ibrahim salam is going to be grateful to him because you have to be grateful to who? Your parents, even if they're not praiseworthy. That's not a condition. So you can praise something or someone without thanking them. That's possible. And you can thank someone without praising them. Even Musa salam, when he admitted that Fir'aun, you have in fact done me a favor. What has he done? He's actually acknowledged that you did do me a favor, so thank you. He's thanked him, but he certainly will not do what? He won't praise him. These are two separate things. But when we say alhamd, then we are combining both of those meanings together. That's the base definition. The the longer linguistics, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow. Okay? So those two things come together. The other brief thing that you need to know about uh, alhamdulillah is that it is a statement that is timeless. It is both, it is both, you can say, khabari and insha'i. What that means is that you are making a statement that in fact, Praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. That is true. But also at the same time, because there's no inna before it, it becomes kalam insha'i, which means that this is an expression of your emotions. You're not just delivering some information when you say alhamdulillah, you're actually voicing out what your heart is feeling. To, to give you an example, if I'm teaching you a class and I'm teaching you vocabulary or I'm teaching you the concept of alhamdulillah, so and in the course of that lecture, when I say Alhamdulillah, this is actually information. 
But when we finish our lesson and I say, Alhamdulillah, we got to finish today. That that was not information, what was that? That was the emotion of gratitude that I felt and I expressed it using the words, Alhamdulillah. So it carries, Alhamdulillah carries ideas and it carries emotions. It is a combination of both of those things at the same time. Is that clear to everybody? It carries ideas and it carries emotions, okay? Now, the hamd of Allah, what do we, th what do we have hamd of Allah for? That's the next question. What do we have hamd of Allah for? Anybody? Everything. That's right, everything. Everything. There is not a restriction on what you have hamd of Allah for. But when in this ayah, Allah says, Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. When he put the ism mawsul, which you haven't done except briefly so far in your grammar studies. When he puts that ism mawsul there, then he has associated whatever, his, whatever is coming with this statement. It has now become inseparable from hamd. Meaning, hamd of Allah is for everything. It's for all things. But in particular, for what I'm about to tell you. In per, there's a special kind of hamd that belongs to Allah because of the fact that He sent the book upon His slave and didn't furnish it with any possibility of deviation. You understand? So there's this, because of the use of that alladhi, that is Mosul, there's a special association made of the praise and gratitude of Allah with the coming down of the Quran upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which, you know, it, it got me thinking. Because there are, you know, there's about 23 or so places in the Qur'an where Allah uses hamd. Allah talks about praise and gratitude. And how does He talk about those, uh, what does He say in those places? One of the most startling places is, Alhamdulillahi alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur. Alhamdulillah, to the one who created the skies and the earth and put in place uh, all kinds of darknesses. He allowed for all kinds of darknesses to exist. And also to alleviate all of those darknesses, what did He also put? Light, one nur. There, even after that, those who disbelieve, they put all of those, they, they, in the matter of their matter, their master, they put things, they equate things. In other words, how can you equate darknesses and light? How can you equate Allah with anything else? Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Right? How can you do that? In other words, Allah is saying that the creation of the skies and the earth, is inseparable. It's pointless if Allah did not put light and darkness. In other words, the contrast between misguidance and guidance. Now, in that ayah, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alhamdulillah, specifically for creating the skies and the earth and the distinction between darkness and light, well, what did Allah give us, the Muslims, that distinguishes darkness from light? It's the book. It's the book. This is why Allah Azza wa says, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Believe in Allah and the Messenger and, and the, the light that we sent down. Quran itself is called Nur. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ نُورًا مُبِينًا We've sent you a clear light. So now, this idea of you know, the, the book being a, a, an ability by which we can see, ability by which we have light. Look at how Allah Azza wa talks about this. He says, مَثَلُ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ كَالْأَعْمَى وَالْأَصَمْ وَالْبَصِيرِ وَالْسَمِيعِ Look at the, the, the interesting comparison. How can two groups, the two groups that are on the one hand blind and mute, blind and deaf, incapable of taking information in from their eyes and no, neither from their ears, how can they be compared to people who can see and hear? So what two things on the one hand? Blindness and deafness, and on the other hand, vision and hearing, right? Now the thing is, the, uh, our experience of guidance, when we experience guidance, that's actually not something you see, it's something you hear. It's about hearing. But the parallel is made that if you don't have the right kind of hearing, it is as, as, you're as disabled as you are blind. So this imagery is very powerful in the Qur'an. It, it, this is why also, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ can the, can, the deviate, can the blind and the one that can see, can they ever be equal? You know? Now, coming back to the ayah of Surah Al-Kahf. How, why is that important? This contrast. Allah says He didn't put any deviation in it. And it stands upright, which we're going to get to a little bit later. So there's a comparison of all things that deviate and all things that don't stand upright and the one thing that does. Just like there's a comparison between people who are blind and people who can see and people who are deaf and people who can hear. There's no comparison between those two. You know someone who's blind is going on a path, they don't even know if they're going straight. They could have iwaj in their path. But someone who can see is going to go straight. You know, they're going to be upright. <laughs>